Hi everyone, this is part two of my environment steel project post-mortem video tutorial. Now speaking more strictly about texturing, this is the first image with some textures on and it actually looked quite horrible the first result with of the bricks mapping and the bricks texture but I guess you just have to push on sometimes and not worry because then I, um, after the first idea of just mixing the brick texture with uh, a level of dirt and a level of plaster uh, it started to look a lot better but still completely wrong uh, until I tried the correct pattern for the bricks that is the pattern that makes sense in uh, construction in the real world for arches I don't think you're ever going to see bricks laid out along the arch especially in these areas where you can clearly see that each brick would have to be curved independently with a different curvature and, and that just doesn't make sense in reality with the correct mapping, the correct size even just and the correct orientation it looked a lot better and it also showed that in this area the mapping had required a lot of manual tweaking to get it right and so I just tried to uh, hide it in the end it mostly worked and it's just barely visible that some areas have stretching next topic would be the dirt map this is the dirt map for that shader we've just seen but there's many more in the in the final image more than half of the materials are done with dirt maps that is I paint in black and white dirtier and more uh, exposed areas and I sometimes there is uh, ambient occlusion baking as a base here but then I did a quick hand paint with just the brushes available in, in Blender with no textures generally with just using the pressure sensitivity uh, some jittering so that the brush is a bit more irregular and then using the smudge tool to give uh, gradients and a bit of soften and, and blur and smudge the final uh, result final result which is never that accurate I mean this is done in 20 minutes uh, uh, total and it's not supposed to show like this if it was showing like this in the render you could see the paint strokes really too much and it actually gets passed through this node that I have, uh, it's also downloadable from the resource page in my blog and it's just a bunch of remap and uh, blend operations that allows you to do mainly one thing but also this other thing uh, the main thing is it allows you to replace black, grey and white with another color or a texture so in the final shader then this gets replaced with uh, bricks, plaster and dirt but it also allows you to uh, overlay the fade between the different areas with some noise pattern and that, as I said, this texture on the right that has been done in 20 minutes with simple brushes is never going to be uh, detailed uh, enough it's never going to have the right pattern but instead of working with complicated brushes it's actually possible to then uh, overlay just a tileable 2D uniform texture of in this case plaster peeling plaster patches and get this kind of detail added and refine the dirt map but dirt maps are not the only technique the only way of making shaders that I use and they are not the best for every situation let's see some some of these dirt maps and in general this is the folder for a texture that I painted specifically for this project so it's the insignia and then all these dirt maps black and white dirt maps this is like the canister on the bottom right of the picture the metal window everything else comes from two other types of material techniques for texturing one is that of using 
the most complete possible photo for the biggest possible element. So like trying to get a photo of a whole facade or of an architectural element. And these are uh, uh, photos that I took with my mirrorless camera around my city. And then later made specular and bump maps. Because at some point, these elements that were textured with just photos, although very interesting for the details, very realistic for the detail, because also the models behind this have been traced from this complex element to match more or less exactly the original architectural element. And this definitely helped with the realism, but it doesn't help with the realism of the shaders, where if you have this picture, then you have to create this too manually from photo and you have to just well, paint, select areas, and manually do a lot of work, a lot more than if you have a dot map based diffuse channel and then you have to derive the specular and bump. You just move some uh, nodes around, reuse the same dirt map and some other terrible textures and you make a perfectly working specular and bump channels. If you start from uh, complete photos, you might get some really interesting and original elements, but then if you want to have a good bump for this or a good specular, you have to work quite a bit more. But anyway, all sorts of in-betweens are also possible. A good number of other elements is made from kit textures, the bricks and the tiles, stuff like also beams and ledges and uh, edges of concrete uh, where you can uh, make uh, a good photo maybe a 3d model uh, that matches perfectly that good photo and then sculpt on it so uh, to have uh, a good diffuse that is photorealistic and then a bump map that you derive from a sculpt that is generally much better than what you can get from a photo where you have just light information and you try with some filters to derive the bump, uh, well, if you go in and sculpt it for real, you probably see quite a difference. And also from that map, bump map, you can derive some really good specular maps. One trick is just, just to use the eye pass filter to highlight the edges and the differences, the discontinuities in the bump map, and you get a really good base for a specular channel that highlights the edges. And looking at the final diffuse pass, uh, you can see an example of these three different approaches to texturing. Mostly is uh, dirt maps, which is generally a quick way to make a material that fits the model, whatever the model is. Then you have this heavily photo-based parts traced on photos of complex elements, like the door, this base, this uh, diamond, wall panel and then the third kind the kits are generally textures that are, might be starting from a single photo and or uh, a model a sculpt and on which I have worked a lot planning to reuse them basically in every situation like bricks you only need one good brick texture or actually you could start from many photos but then you have uh, every time the problem of getting out the, the bump, the specular, or you might start from a very good sculpt on which you map a slightly different tone of brick, or you can make the grout more receding or uh, more jagged, more uniform, cleaner or, or dirtier, and chip away and weather more the surface of the bricks or not. Same for tiles. These are the kind of base objects on which you just work a lot with a lot of different techniques that might be photographic or CG sculpting, etc. Body light and rendering phase, this is of course cycles. Uh, the render was a really slow, uh, high quality render being just a still for personal project, I just let it render. Uh, I still use the limited number of bounces, but that doesn't make the real difference. I mean, I 
guess this took seven hours at 200% HD resolution on a six core 3.2 gigahertz uh, CPU and with more bounces it would have taken even longer but that wouldn't make a big difference uh, in the final result with uh, zero bounces for diffuse and one for glossy uh, yes it could have been quite fast it would be interesting to to test that because in in other situations getting rid of GI and only keeping uh, ray trace reflections uh, one bounce proved uh, to be quite fast as a renderer it's of course totally different than using GI it's not an approximated GI but for animations the same thing with a few tweaks here and there uh, would have been something definitely below one hour of rendering but anyway and the big difference in the final result you can see here the diffuse indirect pass there are just two interesting things one is this big patch of light it's a reflector panel, a white material placed behind this facade and that have could been done with just um, an area light, a normal direct light lamp uh, and reduce the times considerably and everything else, yes there is GI and bounces but they actually affect the final look of the image not that much if you compare it to a careful compositing with uh, uh, ambient occlusion for example. and of course you wouldn't do that for this kind of render but you would do probably um, ambient occlusion plus direct light render if this was an animation so the, the, the way of doing things in cycles is both reliable when you have the time to do this full uh, uh, not ambiguous but brute force GI and there are other situations where you can get some really good looking renders uh, mostly because uh, what matters for me is the node materials and just use uh, ambient occlusion as fill light instead of GI. The other thing, this noise here that's not in the final version, uh, this has been fixed. It's what you see here, uh, the light fall of node. Everything else, balancing the sampling and getting the noise under control and getting rid of fireflies was more or less obvious and intuitive especially because it's an outdoor sunlight scene so fireflies are not that much of an issue as in interiors but the only real cause of fireflies that I had was these uh, artificial lamps that are very close to some surface and this noise is not generated by the lamp itself but by the first second bounce of light that bounces off the reflector and it's difficult to sample and creates a lot of noise. The light fall off node will smooth the decay curve in uh, the area close to the light source. So uh, this lamp here, if I set a uh, light fall off node, this is from some of the other lamps that already had this tweak on and it was still missing for this lamp. If I set it to two, the intensity will be smoothed and reduced in uh, the area of one or two units I believe it is but in the area close to the lamp source and the bigger the number the farther away the light gets dimmed and smoothed and this way you still get some light from the lamp on the meshes and the surfaces close to this lamp but not too much so that you don't get the fireflies all around you still get the GI that is generated by the lamp illuminating like this surface which is basically what you want even if having correct GI and also sampling the very strong light that is emitted by the diffusing element of this lamp would be more realistic but it's not really a big difference Another note about rendering in cycles is uh, putting specular everywhere. This again is not a final frame uh, and some materials have much lower specular or basically don't have specular and I think that the habit of using specular only on very reflective materials compared to reality where every material is somewhat reflective more or less and it's rougher or smoother more mirror-like 
uh, but you do have some reflection and in the past or in real time uh, in the past with uh, less powerful machines and in real time where the rendering has some strict technical limitations some materials like a brick wall might be considered diffuse only non-reflective when you start working with cycles uh, unless you're really aiming for very very fast renders you can simplify your life a lot by putting speculars everywhere so that the material does have some highlights even if they are very rough or very low in intensity it might get more difficult to get a good lighting if some materials re respond a lot to the glossy channel and other materials don't you might get some discontinuities like highlights uh, stopping abruptly at another material that is not maybe not that shiny not metal you may maybe you're going from metal to uh, concrete or metal to ground but you're still supposed to see some highlight on that material too even if it's a very different uh, kind of highlight from the metallic shine of that material if it has some maybe very rough uh, glossy the lighting will be still be easier to get right now last element for the rendering phase volumetrics which i think were quite important and worked well and added a lot to the mood of the scene the problem is they are a bit unreliable and in some situation it's really hard to get them working right so i tried to make a tutorial just about volumetrics a step-by-step -step tutorial but I, I hit a few issues so i'm still working on that uh, like mostly i'm working on the transparency for the volumetrics still i'm not sure how to get right and also in the test scene the other issue i had the volume effect was disappearing depending on the light position and if there was a mesh on top of it casting some shadow i i think that's a bug in in the code anyway for this scene it worked really well this first wasn't showing much uh, of the god ray uh, light shards effect this one shows it really really sharp and that's because it's using volume rendering in the shadowed mode while the following ones this one i think is still shadowed so very sharp even too sharp and it's reasonably fast to render but then i switched to shading which is much slower to render and the quality the sharpness and the definition of the light rays depends on the light cache resolution uh, this thing about a shadowed mode giving very sharp uh, sometimes fake looking uh, effects and the shaded mode being slow but potentially more accurate is probably the biggest catch about uh, volume rendering and trying to get god rays uh, the catch is that the first time you play with the settings you probably won't get any god rays maybe because if you're using shaded which is the one i'm using in the end uh, you need to raise the light cache resolution until you start to see something in this case uh, from the default 50 i went up to 256 before noticing that light rays started to appear and then up to 512 and more for the very last passes and test i went up to 1024 and you could start to see some smaller finer uh, light rays but still it's uh, generally better to use shaded in the end i prefer that because even if it's blurry and you need very high resolution to see the details the other option uh, shadow it's really too sharp some of these rays are really making no physical sense in being this sharp and contrasted and covering the whole screen it just looks like a 2d effect so uh, this was looking at the um, renders looking at the scene uh, there's few things i can say about the setup even if 
still not sure this is the best workflow but anyway uh, the basis is I'm rendering with uh, cycles from a scene that is called well a scene it's the, the default scene then I had a second scene where I linked all the objects and a cube containing the simulation and in this scene I would render out with blender internal the smoke pass and this part of the workflow uh, I, I suggest to follow I think that even if you were able to render uh, together in the same pass in the same render they still think that it's uh, something that is best put together in compositing so I would anyway create a main scene that can be cycles or blender internal and then a second scene where you link all the objects just to have a perfect copy of the original scene plus the cube the domain of the smoke simulation that you're going to create in another scene and it sounds complicated but I think it actually simplifies the whole process and in this scene you can render the past the only thing I would do is to override everything with a material that was just uh, shadeless black and then the volume the volume material is not affected by the override so you, you get only the smoke on a black background but with the obstacles that need to uh, be rendered together with the smoke and then I would composite the, the smoke in the in the final composite and the only significant tweak was to color the smoke and change a bit the brightness and intensity based on the Z depth or actually the, the mist pass so I would color the smoke using the mist pass a, a gradient and the mist pass so that it would get the colors that I wanted for like uh, highlighting or um, let's say detach distinguish better the background by making the background a bit bluer and this area having a sort of fake and and made sun highlight with this orange and actually also I use this to color the smoke for artistic purposes but also based on the Z depth like this area which is a very bright smoke I would turn it down a bit so it wasn't covering too much of the of this part of the architecture and also of course as I said this is the domain for the smoke simulation but I had another scene for the smoke simulation itself this is a mesh that is set to collide with smoke so it will affect the flow and the animation of the smoke but it's a very simplified version of the uh, actual meshes in the scene enough to get a realistic and interesting movement to the smoke but not the full scene that would be just uh, too heavy in polygons to calculate collisions with the smoke for every frame etc it's not necessary and I used a couple of emitters using particles as emission not the mesh because with particles what I found out it was convenient for the main issue of simulating smoke that is getting a flow that is not too dense it's not like a trail of smoke for from an explosion from fire but it's mostly fog so it has to be not too dense and the ways that I found is uh, using particle simulation so an emitter of particles of two kinds uh, both and this base trick or idea that is to uh, give to each particle a big size uh, as smoke emitter so that with few particles you would get a lot of smoke and with a low density so I would generally increase the particle size the smoke particle size to one or even four meters and then decrease the density to 0.4 or even just 0.1 then I have two kinds of emitters actually you can see here some blue and some yellow smoke it's I didn't use the colors for rendering I just used them to differentiate the emitters the blue one is the ground plane that is emitting smoke that is less dense and has 
each particle is, a, is actually a, a bigger size, quite a big size, and it's not using the initial velocity. So this one, the idea is that the ground plane uh, files particles quite fast, so that in a few frames you have particles everywhere, everywhere you need them. In this case, I wanted them just in the first half of the screen. And you filled the area with particles, and you start very fast in the simulation, so that you then have a simulation that in 50 or 100 frames it's, it's done and you get the frame you want. These ones instead shoot particles that are maybe a bit slower, but they have initial velocity. So each of these particles of smoke will move fast based on the original velocity of the particle. And this, is, this yellow one is a smoke that moves through the scene and creates a bit of uh, wind effect in the fog. But I also have the like more static one that just feels a bit everywhere. Last phase is the compositing. I started doing some com minimal compositing very early on, but I tried to keep it not too extreme so that I would basically work on a clean render and try to get the render uh, as good as possible instead of uh, judging always my materials and maybe the reflection or the intensity, just even the, the exposure of the render based on something heavily changed by the compositing. Uh, it's If you start with a heavy compositing earlier on, you might then get with a scene that is completely unbalanced in render and then balanced uh, by the compositing, but why complicated? So, while I was still texturing the main elements, the compositing was limited to what I had put in the block out phase that was a bit of depth fog and basically nothing more. Then I started pushing it a lot more and the final scene has quite a bit of compositing on it. And I show you, this is the node tree, so yeah, it's a lot happening, but in the end is nothing too uh, original, it's just lining and exposure tweaks uh, sometimes done on just some passes and some elements, so uh, there's color correction and exposure correction going on like 10 times for 10 different parts, like the, uh, the background image for the sky or the uh, part about the fog and the volumetrics, and also the other part where color correction is done multiple times is this early part is rebuilding the render from the passes which is not required you can technically do everything just starting from the combined image and tweak that but if you're going to really nitpick the compositing and do a lot of color uh, grading then why not do it on the separate passes before they get merged together and about at this point the image is uh, back to uh, a combined image. So I actually started first making this part of the compositing with all the relevant eff effects. And then instead of using the combined image I added this part where I do some stuff on the individual passes before combining them so it's uh, the base idea is always like uh, you have the diffuse color you sum you add the direct and indirect light then you multiply them by the color and you do the same for the glossy and for the transmission if you have it and then you add all the components together and you get the same image as the combined but you can do stuff in the meanwhile and the only aspect uh, i want to mention in this video is the eye pass filter and the local contrast enhancement. Uh, the rest is standard compositing techniques, but this one is sort of a preferred topic of mine. And what it is technically is uh, an eye pass filter is taking an image, inverting it and blurring it, and then making the difference with the original image. 
The difference is done by using a mix with linear light at 50% uh, with the inverted image, which is also blurred. This way, what you get is uh, a map that is very similar to the result of Unsharp Mask that will basically uh, find the areas where the image changes, where there are discontinuities, and that basically means where you have edges, and strengthen, sharpen those discontinuities and edges. If you do that with a small radius, like four or six pixels on the final color image, what you get is basically a the unsharp mask effect. Doing this setup, you get the mask and then you uh, use overlay or soft light to put this uh, black and white mask over the original image and you get an unsharp mask effect. But that's not the only way to use it. You can see uh, how to use it in practice. There's a post on my blog that details actually the steps. But here I want to mention another possible use purpose of this uh, same setup of nodes. With a small radius, you get an unsharp mask. If you do that on a bigger radius, like 100 pixels or more, and maybe you do that not on the final image, but only on the direct light pass, what you get is an effect of local contrast enhancement and it's also called Retinex uh, if you do it with multiple levels or it's similar to what you get uh, when you process HDR images to tone map and compress the range and the final result is a more painterly image with uh, the shapes and the details enhanced and the highlights compressed. And so as you see, it's not just uh, sharpening the image, it's actually uh, something that affects quite a bit the look of the final picture. Let's see in practice what this means. You can see it actually uh, quite well on this area. Normally, without using that kind of setup, this would be a uniformly shadowed plane. But you can see that passing it through that filter, you get it a bit darker on the edge between the, the light and the shadow and fades to a brighter color inside the shadowed area. And what is the point of this technique is, well, to have something like this, that is a shadow area, which is black but not pitch black. You can still, still see some details and it actually helps a lot the readability uh, of the image, but it can also uh, lower the photorealism and make it look a lot more like a painting than a photo. This kind of techniques, it's used a lot in photography too. And technically the HDR tone mapping operators are much more complicated math than just doing this high pass filter uh, or retinex uh, effect. But on an actual photography, you get a bit more painterly effect but it's still a photography. On a CG render, uh, it can really make it a lot more painterly and less photorealistic. Last consideration about characters and adding plot to an environment scene. I had a, a plan for this personal project not to include characters because I tried that in the previous one and of course not being a character artist focusing mostly on environments they weren't at the same level as the rest, like the most obvious thing, the skin shader. And so that kind of distracted the feedback a bit and I didn't want to spend time on something that I don't do for a job normally. But it's also true that then environment scene can get the, the critique of uh, lacking a focal point. It doesn't need to be a character but uh, that's actually the easiest thing to create a scene that feels complete is to add a character. And so I did it last time, I avoided it this time for these reasons, I'll probably try it again uh, next time I do a personal project, maybe avoiding to have a skin shader, but doing something with some more action plot and characters.
Still, I thought I could add something that helps, uh, if not as a focal element, because again, an environment scene is about looking at everything, and it must have a composition, good perspective, but the idea is for the scene to have a lot of focal points, like you could focus here, then move to this facade, then move to this one, then go back here, and none of this is the only focal point of the picture. The point is to get them uh, arranged well so that you keep looking around. But still, so when I decided not to add a character in this area, it would have been of course here, in the middle of this empty road, I still tried to fill the road as much as I could, and also, if not a character, still some plot element, uh, some element of uh, a story or something going on in, in the picture. And since it was abandoned and also I was uh, using as reference uh, this honor that has this uh, major plague team, uh, I just thought of a cordon that is not specified what is about, if it's a crime or a plague or a, uh, whatever. But still, I think it worked in terms of uh, symmetry with the arc and creating some composition and some dividing the space into areas and also like, making you wonder about why there's a cordon and what's going on uh, on the other side. And that's all for this tutorial. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments or questions, please post.